from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We ready? Good morning. This is exciting. Here we are, starting the day of the National Book Festival here in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Welcome especially to those of you who are new, relatively new to Washington, D.C. I'm Amy Stoles. I'm the Director of Literature at the National Endowment for the Arts, and it's my distinct pleasure to open the National Book Festival by featuring our Poetry Out Loud winners from this year and our distinguished uh, judge from this year and poet, Adrian Matika. Before um, we do that, um, I'm going to, there's a couple things I want to say. Um, that all day here at the Library of Congress National Book Festival, we're recognizing and celebrating the importance of reading and authors and books. And the Library of Congress makes it seem so easy to do this every year. But the truth is, the National Book Festival is a huge undertaking, and it is a huge financial undertaking. And it's been made possible by generous support from our sponsors. The National Endowment for the Arts is one. You can see who they are in your programs and on the video monitors around the convention center, but we can't take for granted that this event will continue to exist. So I'd like to ask you to consider making a contribution. Using your cell phone, you can send a text to make a one-time gift that will be added to your mobile phone bill, and the details are on screen and on the back of your program. And so now on to the main event. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts Literature Program supports um, reading and books and authors across the country in many ways. We give direct grants to um, uh, uh, poets and writers and translators. We give grants to organizations like publishers and uh, literary centers and service organizations and book festivals like this um, to do what they do to encourage people to read. Um, we also have a program called the NEA Big Read, which is a community read program. We give uh, grants to 75 communities around the country, and we have a program called Poetry Out Loud, which we're going to feature today, and you're going to hear all about. You can uh, find out more information about our programs in the back at the table. We have a whole bunch of um, pamphlets and our wonderful staff back there. Hi, staff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we, uh, I'm going to turn it over to um, Eleanor, who has been managing the Poetry at Lab program for a long time. I want to take a moment to acknowledge our national student and poets who um, were just recently named, and it's very exciting. And it's always exciting when we have um, uh, young poets like Poetry Out Loud and from the National um, Student Poets um, going around the country as ambassadors of poetry because they are passionate of poetry and they're good at what they do. The President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, and the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers partner to present the National Students, uh, Student Poets Program, the country's highest honor for youth poets presenting original work. So five outstanding high school poets whose work exhibits exceptional creativity and dedication to their craft and promise are selected annually for a year of service as national poetry ambassadors, much like our Poetry Out Loud folks are. So I really want to acknowledge the five who just recently um, won this distinguished award. And I'm going to say their names and ask them to stand up and so we can applaud. Um, representing the Southeast, um, Annie Castillo. Representing the West, Kin Kinsel Houston. Representing the Midwest, Ben Lee. Representing the Northeast, Juliette Lubama. And representing the Southwest, Camila Simiguel. Round of applause for all of them, please. Thank you. I had the pleasure of listening to them yesterday and reciting their poems and um, was um, incredibly moved and uh, inspired that this is our future. In the same way that when I went to the um, finals, and um, I know Adrian can speak to this too, as can Eleanor and everybody in the audience, that when you hear these poets recite poetry, whether it's their own or others, um, it makes you really, really hopeful for our future. Um, and that they can do all sorts of things and have dedicated um, uh, a portion of their lives to poetry. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eleanor Billington to tell you about the po uh, Poetry Out Loud and to introduce Adrian. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Good morning. So welcome to the festival. Amy already welcomed you, but I want to do it again. It's really a wonderful event. We are so happy you're here with us this morning. On behalf of everybody at the NEA, thank you for being here. 
So as Amy said, my name is Eleanor Billington. I've been helping to manage Poetry Out Loud for many years, and it is quite a wonderful job. I'm very, very lucky. So I want to tell you a little bit about the program. I'm going to do that first and then introduce the guests on the stage, and then I'll get out of the way, and they're going to do their thing, which is going to be great. So Poetry Out Loud is a national youth arts program that seeks to foster a new generation of literary readers and engaged citizens by capitalizing on recent trends in poetry. And those are recitation and performance. So Poetry Out Loud encourages high school students to learn classic and contemporary poems through memorization and then public recitation. So this was started as a partnership back in 2005 between the NEA and our great partners at the Poetry Foundation and 53 state and jurisdictional arts agencies across the country, which means that the Poetry Out Loud program is in every state, DC, the US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Since the program began, we have had 3.3 million students participate and over 50,000 teachers across the country. The program helps students build public speaking skills and self-confidence, but most importantly, it really helps them discover their own creative voice. I say this every year at the book festival, but I say it because it's important for us to acknowledge. And for many people, and I was included in this group actually before I started to work on the program, poetry recitation can sound a little bit dry, right? But you're gonna see in, in a couple minutes firsthand that the power of a poem spoken aloud um, is real and it's moving and these, these students are absolutely phenomenal. So how does the program work? It's a pyramid structure. It's a lot like the spelling bee. The students start at the classroom level, and then they move on to a school-wide competition, and then they may have a regional or a state finals competition, and then they finally come to DC, to the national finals, which are held here every spring. If you are an interested high school student in the audience or an interested high school teacher, there is still time to sign up for this year. So if you are, want to find out more or want to get in touch with your state arts agency that's hosting the competition in your state, you can go to the table in the back, like Amy said, where our staff members are and find out more about the program. So you can get involved this year. It is not too late to get involved. We have a great website that's dedicated to Poetry Out Loud. It's poetryoutloud.org. And on the website, there are over 900 poems that are eligible for recitation. There's a great teacher's guide. There are tips for reciting. There are great video examples. Actually, most of the students on the stage are featured in videos online. So you can find out a lot more the, uh, about the program there. Again, everything in the back table about POL is free, and everything online is free, too. Last year, we had more than 315,000 students participate in Poetry Out Loud. And today, you're going to hear from three of those students, three state champions who made it all the way to the top nine at the 2017 Poetry Out Loud National Finals. Poetry Out Loud students are eligible for prizes at the state and national level, including a $20,000 prize for the national champion. Every year, Poetry Out Loud awards more than $100,000 in prizes and school stipends. So a $20,000 prize is not, nothing to scoff at. It's incredible, especially for a poetry recitation, right? But we believe that the real reward for, for us as administrators of this program, but also for the students, is when they connect very deeply with the poems that they memorize. In a recent conversation with the Iowa Review, our new US Poet Laureate, Tracy K. Smith, describes one of the first and most important relationships she had with a memorized poem. She says this. In one of my fifth grade textbooks, there is an Emily Dickinson poem titled, I'm Nobody, Who Are You? I inadvertently memorized it. It almost felt like the speaker and I were in collusion with one another, like there was this amazing space the speaker had invited me into. I liked that sense of private mischief that poetry seemed to be able to extend. This morning, we extend an invitation to you to enjoy what these pro poems will bring to your own life experience we invite you to listen differently and to embrace the mystery and mischief of language. And we ask that you honor the work of these students as they share their perspectives and talents with you. Before we begin, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about all of our guests and our moderator. So Irene Mann, Irene, do you mind waving? <laughs> Irene is the 2017 Poetry Out Loud state champion from New York. She's a senior at Syosset High School on Long Island. And she is here with her mom and her teacher. She is very involved in the African American Club and is captain of interpretive events on her school's speech and debate team. Irie wants to pursue acting as a career, and she enjoys writing plays and sharing her own stories with a limited audience right now. She said just her dog, so she's working up to a broader <laughs> audience, right? Uh, Nick Amador, Nick, 
<laughs> is a 2017, uh, is our 2017 Poetry Out Loud second place national finalist, and he's a senior at Punahou High School in Hawaii. He is a pa he's passionate about theater, stories, and combating climate change. In his free time, he writes poetry, watches Game of Thrones, and plays with his dogs. So we have a canine theme. <laughs> um, we also are so happy to welcome the 2017 Georgia State Champion, who is also our Poetry Out Loud national champion for this year, Samara Huggins. At the end. <laughs> Samara is a freshman at Pratt Institute in New York. She is studying fashion design there. In addition to designing, she is a writer and a supporter of all things creative. She's also going to be featured at the International Storytelling Festival in Jonesboro, Tennessee next month. Finally, we are very, very pleased and honored to be joined by poet and Poetry Out Loud national finals judge, Adrian Matika. Adrian is gonna to lead today's discussion with our students. He is the author of four books of poetry. His third book of poems, The Big Smoke, about prize fighter Jack Johnson, was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. His most recent collection, Map to the Stars, explores the tensions between geography, race, and poverty in America during the Reagan era in the 80s. You can hear more from Adrian about his new book right here in this room at 1 p.m. But now we're gonna talk about poetry out loud. So he's a champion for the program. We are so honored and just delighted to have him here this morning. You guys are going to really enjoy their discussion. So that is more than enough for me. It is time to turn everything to Adri over to Adrian and the students. Thank you guys again for being here and enjoy listening. <laughs> Thank you for that, Eleanor. I'm gonna sit down because I got rained on and you'll notice that my pants are all soaked if I stand up, right? But I'm so glad to be here and I don't know where Amy is, but thank you, Amy, for that too. I've been really fortunate to work with Poetry Out Loud for, I don't know, maybe eight years. Um, I started out as a, as a local judge in St. Louis and got to spend time with the program that way. And then I, I became a regional judge, and then last year I was fortunate enough to, to hear all three of the, the amazing performers on stage right now um, in last, last April as they, I mean, there's, you're going to hear it. So I thought that what we might do to start out with, um, because this is a, a program about poetry and about recitation and about inhabiting a kind of art in a way that makes it publicly accessible, I thought the best way to begin would be to allow them to, to recite a poem um, for you. And, and so then you'll get to see it, and then we can talk about it after you get a better sense. Um, Irie, do you want to start? And then we'll sure. just go across. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the Golden Shovel by Terence Hayes after Gwendolyn Brooks, 1, 1981. When I am so small, Da Sock covers my arm. We cruise at twilight until we find the place the real men lean, bloodshot and translucent with cool. His smile is a gold-plated incantation as we drift by women on bar stools with nothing left in them but approachlessness. This is a school I do not know yet, but the cue sticks mean we are rubbed by light Smooth as wood, the lurk of smoke thin to song. We won't be out late. Standing in the middle of the streets last night, we watched the moonlit lawns, and a neighbor strike his son in the face. A shadow knocked straight. Da promised to leave me everything. The shovel we used to bury the dog, the words he loved to sing his rusted pistol, his squeaky Bible, his sin. The boy's sneakers were light on the road. We watched him run to us, looking wounded and thin. He'd been caught lying or drinking his father's gin. He'd been defending his ma, trying to be a man. We stood in the road. And my father talked about jazz, how sometimes a tune is born of outrage. By June, 
the boy would be locked up state. That night, we got down on our knees in my room. If I should die before I wake, Da said to me, it will be too soon. Two, 1991. Into the tented city we go, weakened by the fire's ethereal afterglow. Born lost and cooler than heartache, what we know is what we know, the left hand severed and schooled by cleverness. A plate of weak days cooking, the hour lurking in the afterglow, a late night chant. Into the city we go, close your eyes and strike a blow. Light can be straightened by its shadow. What we break is what we hold. A singular blue note, an outcry singed exiting the throat. We push until we thin, thinking we won't creep back again. While God licks his kin, we sing until our blood is jazz. We swing from June to June. We sweat to keep from weeping, groomed on a diet of hunger. We end too soon. Thank you. <laughs> That's, that's, re that's really wonderful. And the poem that uh, Irie just recited, The Golden Shovel, is based on a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, too. So the end of each line is a word from Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, We Real Cool. It's a really wonderful kind of take on form, and yeah. then also just a beautiful poem. Yeah. I really want to ask you about that, but I know we have, we, we have this limited time. So <laughs> there's a whole conversation I'd love to have around yeah. these poems. But let's, uh, hey, thank you for that. Nick, would you like to go? Yeah, ahead? absolutely. Lions by Sandra McPherson. Lions don't need your help. In the Serengeti, for instance, 1,000, like the very rich, hold sway over more than Connecticut. The mane of the lion, like the hooked jaw of the male salmon, acts as a shield for defense and is the gift of sexual selection. His eyes are fathomless amber. The lion is the most social of the big cats. Pride members are affectionate among themselves. They rub cheeks when they meet. They rest and hunt together, and cubs suckle indiscriminately. But strangers or members of a neighboring pride are not usually accepted. If a pride male meets a strange female, he may greet her in a friendly fashion and even mate with her, but the pride females will drive her off. Male lions, usually depicted as indolent freeloaders who let the lionesses do all the hunting, are not mere parasites. They maintain the integrity of the territory. Lions eat communally, but completely lack table manners. Indeed, lions give the impression that their evolution toward a social existence is incomplete. That cooperation in achieving a task does not yet include the equal division of the spoils. More bad news, lions are not good parents. But prowess, that they have. Their courage comes from being built like an automobile for power. A visible lion is usually a safe lion, but one should never feel safe, because almost always there is something one can't see. Given protection, and power, a lion does not need to be clever. Now, lions are not the most likable kind of animal, unless you're a certain type of person that is not necessarily leonine in the sense of manly or ferocious, but one who wouldn't mind resting 20 of 24 hours a day and who is not beyond stealing someone else's kill about half the time. <laughs> lions are not my favorite kind of animal. Gazelles seem nicer. A zebra has his own sort of appealing pathos, especially when he is sure prey for the lion. Lions have little to offer the spirit. 
If we made of ourselves parks and placed the lion in the constituent he most resembled, he would be in our blood. Thank you. <laughs> really yes, a visible lion is usually a safe lion. Is that the one? <laughs> I'm going to take that with me. And <laughs> I think it's, it's wonderful to have the golden shovel and then uh, Sandra McPherson's poem one after another to see the, the range, uh, not only of poetry in its, in its own, but also the way in which uh, these young performers have been you know, taken advantage of the kind of tone of poetry to share. It's really, it's really great. Thank you for that. Would you, Samira, would you like to go ahead? The Farmer by W.D. Earhart. Each day, I go into the fields to see what is growing and what remains to be done. It is always the same thing. Nothing is growing. Everything needs to be done. Plow, harrow, disc, water. Pray till my bones ache and hands rub blood raw with honest labor. All that grows is the slow, intransigent intensity of need. I have sown my seed on soil guaranteed by poverty to fail. But I don't complain, except to passers-by who ask me why I work such barren earth. They would not understand me if I stooped to lift a rock and hold it like a child, or laughed, or told them it is their poverty I labor to relieve. For them, I complain. A farmer of dreams knows how to pretend. A farmer of dreams knows what it means to be patient. Each day, I go into the fields. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Thank you for that, all three of you. Um, so a farmer of dreams knows how to pretend. What a wonderful metaphor. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you selected that poem? And then maybe we can spin this in. I know there's 900 poems you can choose from. <laughs> So maybe talk a little bit about what drew you to that to start out with, because that's important. The Farmer was the last poem that I chose, because for the competition, you have to, each student has to have three poems. So I chose Novel by Arthur Rimbaud, Dream Song 14 by John Berryman, and then The Farmer. And I needed a different tone. I had a, a youthful, conversational tone with Novel, and more sarcastic and cynical tone with Berryman's poem. So I wanted something that was a little bit deeper, a little bit darker. Yeah. And this, this poem is about perseverance and yeah. struggles. So. Yeah. And it feels very timely, too, right? I mean, one of the great gifts of poetry is it can be timeless. Right. It's the kind of thing that, you could, if it was written in 1800, it could still matter now because those basic things need and want and love, they, they sort of transcend, right? The trick is figuring out how uh, to offer that message to someone. Now, did you read poems before you started in this program, or was this something that the, did the program kind of get you going? Did I read them out loud? Like yeah, well, just in general, were you a fan of poetry to start out? Oh, I was. Yeah? Yeah. See, I write poetry a little bit. See, this is the thing, right? I was, I, you know, I'm just going to confess now that when I was in high school, I was busy doing everything possible not to read. So when I spend time with people who are so much more sophisticated than I was, I just like, wait a minute, you knew about poetry? I didn't even find out about poetry until high school. I thought, I thought poetry and rap music were the same thing. Right? <laughs> uh, so then probably since you came into it that way, since you already knew about poems, is there, uh, has the program, working in this program at all, changed the way that you imagine a poem 
to, to work or to be. Yeah, yeah. How so? Now I know that poetry is really alive. You know, you hear mm. your English teachers tell you that literature is timeless and poetry it lives and all this stuff, and it sounds like it makes sense, but I didn't believe it until I started in Poetry Out Loud and until I made the poem come alive. Yeah, that's really wonderful. What about you, Nick? Had you been reading poems before this, or was this something that you came to through Poetry Out Loud? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, poetry was never a huge part of my life until Poetry Out Loud. Um, I, I, I'm an actor, so I, I had done a lot of theater, and I think the, part of the reason that I started with Poetry Out Loud is because I love being in front of people, and I love, I love talking. Um, <laughs> so I think, I, I think that uh, that is why I got involved in, in Poetry Out Loud. Um, but poems are like friends, you know, you have to, you have to spend time with them in order, in order to realize what, not only what they mean, but what they mean to you as an individual and, and how you can uh, try your best to, to do justice to that message and make sure that other people understand what it means to you um, through the way that you speak it. So Poetry Out Loud has allowed me to understand poems in a completely different way. I have, I have a totally changed and, and improved um, appreciation for what poetry is. Yeah, and, and you get to come to D.C. And I get to come to D.C. <laughs> like, like, it's like, far away. <laughs> like, it's really far away. I think you were, you, this was your second year in the, in the finals group tour, the regional group. Right? Yes, yeah. Uh, so this past spring was, um, uh, I won second place, and that was the second time that I had made it to nationals. The year before, I had won third place. Yeah, and so, we, so I got the opportunity to hear Nick two years in a row, and it was wonderful both times. And so it's, really, you know, it's not surprising that, that that the, the process of articulating poetry, reciting poetry, would speak to you as a, mm -hmm. as a, a, a theater major, too, because po some poems are just monologues, yeah. right? So you have the opportunity. The best poetry, and I think the, all three of you displayed this, communicates and, and it shares a kind of thing the, in, in the truest sense, right? There, there's poems that require digging in and learning and reading and rereading, but for me, the, the greatest poems offer themselves up and we can assist in that in some way as readers. Yeah. Ari, did you read poetry before this, or was this a new thing for you? This was a very new thing. <laughs> I have never really gotten into poetry before. Mm -hmm. um, even in high school, I've never read a poem and gotten into it mm -hmm. until my teacher was like, how about this? Join Poetry Out Loud. And I was like, yeah. okay. And then that's when poetry kind of mm -hmm. stuck with me and I understood what poetry meant. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at it in a different way and I really got into it more than any piece of literature really. Yeah. And I spent my most time looking at poems, mm -hmm. learning about poets, and it was a whole different world. So I enjoyed it very much. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I, the idea too of uh, discovering this new art, it's the oldest art, right? Yeah. Really, this is the thing, it's the oldest form of literature. And it comes from the tradition that we were just we sharing, right? It's the oral tradition of hearing a story told. And it's so, so wonderful to embrace that again. And I've had this theory, it keeps be not being true, that at some point poetry is going to become the most popular art form ever, because it's <laughs> short. <laughs> and so yeah. you know, I'm like, OK, there's this thing. You, you have it all right there. It doesn't take uh, you know, three weeks like it takes to read a novel. Uh, it's, it's for you, it gives itself to you in a short period of time, but somehow that just keeps not being the case. <laughs> so do you have a favorite poem now that you've spent all of this time? You know right? what, I've, my favorite poems right now, I've spent the most time with the three poems that I've picked sure. for Poetry Out Loud, and yeah. I think I understand them so much more than the other poems that I've looked at, and I've, I mean, they've been in my backpack for the longest, they've been in my pocket <laughs> for the longest, I mean, so those are my favorite poems. It's, I think it's the most thing that I put my time into because they've stuck with me for a very long time now. And yeah, yeah I would say those are my favorite poems yeah. right now. Yeah, those, are, those are good poems to appreciate. So what yes. were the other two? So Break of Day by mm -hmm. John Donne mm -hmm. and also American Smooth by Rita Dove. So yeah, they're yeah. all kind of different from each yeah. other. Yeah. yeah, but all very sonically pleasing. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I think that that's also the the great gift of this is that there's a just in this list that I read gave us it, it spans centuries. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, poetry is so timeless. You can have John Donne next to Rita yeah. Dove, 
and, and they don't seem in opposition in any really wonderful way. Nick, what about you? Who is it? What's your favorite poem or your favorite poet right now? My favorite poem is The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock <laughs> by T.S. Eliot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was, I think that was the first poem uh, that I was just like, wait a minute, you can do that in yeah, language? Yeah. I think it's like, it should be a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the silent seas. It was, it, it, it was over for me once I started to, to access it like that. Do you remember any of the poem? Could you, could I you, do, could yeah, you yeah just the, the beginning, because yeah. that's what captured me right away is, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out across the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. And, and the first time that I read those words, in an English class, actually, I, I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. Like, like you can do that. And yeah. the, the reason that it's my favorite poem is because, you know, it, it is a really long one, so there's a lot to digest with it. But um, I think that, that the purpose of art is storytelling. And really, really good art can um, familiarize the unfamiliar, but really great art can defamiliarize the familiar. Um, you know, like William Carlos Williams' Red Wheelbarrow. That's, that's kind of an infamous example because it's, I mean, everybody knows what a wheelbarrow looks like, but just something about the way that he writes it is like, do I know what a wheelbarrow looks like? <laughs> but the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock takes, I, I mean, like, it, it takes the idea of life and just completely tosses it on its head and, you're, and, and the way that it does it is so beautiful. Yeah, and it, it, it made, that's great. Did you, do you agree with that, Samara, that, that, that that's what art can do? Can you, yeah, I've I never saw. heard it said like that. That was beautifully put. But yeah, <laughs> I saw I, you nod, and I was like, yeah, we're, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what's, your, what's your favorite poem? Right one now? of my favorite poems, because I, I don't think I have just one. Yeah, um, yeah. It's one that I recited maybe two years ago at Poetry Out Loud. Mm. Um, what's it called? A Locked House by W.D. Snodgrass. It's about this love that kind of falls apart, but it's, it's told kind of as a metaphor about a house that, that is deteriorating over time. So. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Do you remember any of it? You could I remember it. the last stanza, yeah. yeah. The house still stands locked as it stood untouched a good two years after you went. Some things passed in the settlement some things slipped away. Enough's left that I come back sometimes. The theft and vandalism were our own. Maybe we should have known. Oh, that's really great. <laughs> So you know, we talked a little bit about this before we started the program, and I was like, okay, who who remembers poems? Because I don't remember any poems. I'm in like a line here, a line there. This is what I my job. I'm a professor. I teach poetry every day, and I still don't know more than a line or two here or there, right? Uh, that's what all my sheets of notes are for. When I come up, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we've got these memorized, no problem. <laughs> and so there's not only uh, I mean, I, well, it makes me feel really, uh, it makes me feel good about where poetry is going to be and where it's going to go continuing and we're going to run out of time here in just a second so I left them with I want to leave them with one really tough question because I know they can handle this question um, so I, I think quite a bit about what a poem is and what it can do um, but what's the difference do you think and I'll just start with you Samara what is the what's the difference uh, between you know a poet, a poetry and like I don't know like a YouTube video and what can poems do that YouTube or uh, photograph or something like that cannot do. <laughs> One of the reasons that I love poetry is because it is so concise. The poet has a select amount of words that they decide they can use, but they have to convey so much emotion and a story and passion, and they have to do that in, in such a short set of words and, and the structure matters so much and I think that in a video you can see everything. Everything is in front of your eyes at mm -hmm. once but with poetry you have to dissect it and it can mean so much more. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very, it's very personal in that yeah. way, right? You can mm -hmm. own it. That's great. Nick, what about you? The same question. Yeah, I think other, other mediums like YouTube videos, you know, like, like books, like paintings, they're, they're really good at um, taking something abstract and 
making it accessible. And poetry does do that to an extent, but what sets poetry apart is its ability to, you know, like I said before, defamiliarize the familiar. Take something that you're used to, writing about something completely ordinary and finding the things that are abstract about it and um, creating new worlds from ordinary experiences. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Yeah, I think poetry, it, it gives you, you can visualize everything for yourself. Um, a video, it's already there for you. you. You're watching it, you've already seen someone else's perspective, but you can have those, you know, your own thoughts and your own imagery and you can make up anything. It's your own world. I think that's why it's so intimate. And also a photograph, it's, it's just a moment. And I think poetry, it's a whole story. Yeah. You know, it's your own world. You can create it however you want. And yeah. I think that's the difference for me. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's so true. It's, it's really wonderful. Listen, that is, that is great. I am so proud of the work. That, like, I had anything to do with it. I had nothing to do with the work you, the three of you have done, but I'm so <laughs> proud of the way that you represent poetry, right? There, there are people in the audience who actually can help take credit for maybe supporting a little bit, but you all did the work, and you learned these poems and recited them beautifully. So thank you so much for your work and for sharing your poems with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, I thought we were almost done. Okay, I, so um, do we, how much time do we have? Ten minutes? Okay. So we have just a little bit of time, and I wanted to close everything out with, if this is okay, asking you each to, to recite one, one last poem. Can we do that? Um, <laughs> she was like, I'm, I'm closing in now. I thought I was ready to go. <laughs> I, I, if, if, you, you don't want, if you don't want to, I mean, I, I, I was hoping we'd have time, but can, can we do that? I don't think I know. Okay, that's okay. That's all right. Um, so I'll tell you what. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, and hey, listen, um, this is going to be the last thing we're doing. Thank you all so much for coming and listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, sure. Thank you, Irie. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Hi, guys, again. <laughs> <laughs> Break of Day by John Dunn. Tis true, tis day. What though it be? Oh, wilt thou therefore rise from me? Why should we rise? Because tis light? Did we lie down because twas night? Love, which in spite of darkness brought us hither, should in despite of light keep us together. Light hath no tongue, but is all I. If it could speak as well as spy, this were the worst that it could say. That being well, I fain should stay, and that I loved my heart in honor so, that I would not from him that had them go. Must business thee from hence remove? Oh. That's the worst disease of love. The poor, the foul, the false love can admit. But not the busied man. He which hath business and makes love doth do such wrong as when a married man doth woo. <laughs> I feel stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2017 winners of Poetry Out Loud, here they are. Incredible. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.